All right, so fun with Flutter. I don't have a lot of slides, and most of my slides are actually um, uh, just like diagrams that I copy and pasted from the Flutter documentation. <clears throat> so let's talk about how this particular uh, talk came about. First of all, thanks for everybody that's here from the Flutter user group. I am looking for somebody to take over the Flutter user group, or the Flutter <laughs> meetup. I don't know if I'm going to organize any more events, uh, but this Java user group is always fun to hang out with, and that's, that's why we're doing it. Uh, so I actually started off my career doing computer graphics programming in the 90s in C and C++. And I stopped doing computer graphics in the year 2000, switched to Java, and haven't really paid any attention to computer graphics until I randomly ran into Flutter in November and started watching the videos and went, oh my, this is the first cross-platform GUI framework I see that looks like it would be fun to use. And then in a drunken moment in November, I told Jonathan that I would actually do a Flutter talk. And he's like, great idea. Are you available in February? And said, yes, I am. And then the week before, I realized it was my wife's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's the scheduling conflict that you heard about on the meetup. So I'm like, fine, I'll do it next month. OK. Uh, so what I've got here is an incredibly introductory talk. So for some of you guys that have said you're a full-time Flutter developer, please help me out when I get stuck. If I get asked a question I don't know the answer to, but you know the answer to, you can give the answer. You can give the answer, and you will get an IntelliJ All right. Now, 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 you can't be asking the hard question and answering it. <laughs> All right, so that's that. All right, so the, the goal tonight is to basically show the Flutter workflow. That's what actually sold me on the framework. Like, oh, wow, this looks easy and fun. Uh, I want to talk about the Flutter architecture, which was the second thing that sold me about the framework. Actually understanding that the architecture of it is exactly the same as the architecture of all the game engines I used to work on and all the graphics software I used to write. It's incredibly ambitious what they did in it. Like, wow, kudos for even attempting such a crazy thing as Flutter. Um, we'll talk a bit about how to do Flutter layout. And I found that the Dart programming language is a lot of fun to use. So we'll, we'll see some interesting things about Dart in the way. Uh, so that's the plan. So that's all the slides I have. We're going to start. So what do you need to do to get going with Flutter? First you do it, thing you do is you go to flutter.dev. Um, so there is the uh, Flutter developer website. Uh, you go to Docs. Uh, you go through the process of setting it up. The interesting thing about setting it up is that it's distributed as a Git repository. So if I go here into my Git, uh, oh, cd dev git, you will find the uh, oh, oh, hold on. new layout on this. This is not my normal key, uh, machine. It's my new machine. So I don't, I'm not yet uh, remembering all the new scheme that I came up with for directories. So Flutter itself is distributed as a Git repo. You pull it down. Uh, you go through a bunch of the stuff. You get a CLI called Flutter. You can use this Flutter CLI to create an app. Uh, so what I've done is I've just installed it into my, my path. I found it kind of interesting that it's distributed as a Git repo. Works pretty well. So makes upgrading easy and all that type of stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of um, other stuff that you're going to um, need to install. Uh, I found the instructions to be very accurate. So that was good. So you start with something like Flutter create test. Uh, well, first type of the day uh, for. All right, <laughs> um, okay, we're going to do it with the GUI. You can do it in the command line, <laughs> but I am going to do it in the GUI. Yeah. Uh, so uh, apparently, this thing works with Visual Studio Code and Android Studio. So I'm going to use Android Studio for this because it is a little bit easier, and I, I know IntelliJ reasonably well. And does it? Oh, come on, close, please. Oh man, seriously, close. Close. All right, so we're going to do Android Studio. 
So we'll start completely from scratch. Android Studio. All right. Uh, you'll have to install the Flutter plugin into it. Again, the docs are, are pretty accurate. And uh, what we're going to do is start a new Flutter project, Flutter application. Uh, let's call this one uh, uh, T-Jug. All right, next. You know, fill in the standard forms, click Finish, and we're going to get somewhat of a working app. And then you'll, you'll see my favorite part, uh, some of my favorite parts about working with Flutter. So to make things simple, I'm going to go here to the docs. I'm going to cut and paste the simplest possible um, uh, example, which is this one here. And then we'll go like this and there. And what we're going to do first is we need to run this on some mobile device. So what I like about it is there's this little drop down. And I can do things like open an iOS simulator. And it's going to launch. And then I'm going to open an Android simulator. And then I'm going to launch my application on both, which is kind of fun. So part of the, 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 the value of Flutter is that it is cross-platform. You can work with multiple things on it. Uh, oh, come on. Stop getting get out of my way. OK. Um, so there we go. Uh, so what do I need to do? I have the thing that I want to run it on. And then I have the Dart program that I want to run it on. And I hit Run. And it should go ahead now. And it's going to uh, compile this with Xcode and do all the stuff. I have never used Xcode before. I know how to start it. And that's about it. So for any of the iOS developers that are here, like what it does underneath the hood, I couldn't tell you. But all I know is, there you go. I got Hello World. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's good, OK? And uh, now I can do, go here and I can say, great, I would like uh, an Android Pixel emulator. Um, so it's going to launch one for me. And I can now do the same thing, which is to go down here. Oh, hold on a second. Where's my Android Pixel emulator? Uh, here's my emulator here. Uh, same sort of thing. I'm going to now uh, say I would like to also run this application on my Android device uh, simulator. And I can hit play. And now you can see the number has changed to 2 because it says there are two versions of the application running. One is running on the Android simulator. And uh, one is running on the iPhone simulator. So let's wait for it to come up. Um, well, we're testing the power of my Core i9 MacBook Pro right now. It's uh, OK. Why did, oh, there we go. It's coming. Hello, world. Can I? And here's the best part. If I plug my iPhone into the computer, it will detect it, and I can run it on my iPhone, which is pretty neat. So as a person who stopped doing graphics programming and GUI programming, because I found GUI programming ridiculously annoying, because you keep having to deal with crazy frameworks and crazy kind of stuff doesn't align right and kind of feel like you're wasting your time because other people didn't make it easy to do things. Um, so now I should see my iPhone in here. And I could press it, and then it will run on my phone, and you can see it on my phone screen. But that's kind of the, 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 the basic uh, workflow. Let me actually make my fonts bigger so we can look at the code. Changed all the wrong fonts. Hold on, guys. Yeah, I did the wrong font here, guys. Sorry about that. Don't overwrite it. Go into font, change to 16, hit apply. OK, there we go. Can you guys see it in the back? Yeah. All right, cool. So um, what do you need to make this work? Well, um, it's so when you program in Flutter, you are programming in Dart, which is a programming language from Google. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they chose Dart. I think part of it is that Oracle sued them to 
over Java, <laughs> which would be one of the reasons why. Uh, two is there's a lot of people that legitimately find Java verbose. And if you're going to do GUI programming the way uh, philosophically that uh, Flutter says you should do it, you don't want to touch Java. Your life will be miserable if you did that. Uh, your code will be too verbose. Uh, so uh, a little bit about what's happening with the code here. So first of all, I'm importing the material design libraries from material design. I have a main function. I call a run app. And I create a Dart object called center, which is a widget. And that widget has a child in which I'm creating another widget called text. And I'm saying, hello world. And then I'm saying the direction is left to right. I am creating objects in a programming language. But what's missing from that? Who's like, where's my, where's my new keyword, right? Well, apparently, new is optional in Flutter. So this is one of the, uh, not in Flutter, in Dart, sorry. Dart makes new optional, which makes it easier to uh, build up object graphs. Because whenever you're doing GUI programming in an object-oriented language, you end up creating widgets which have parents and children. And the new keyword just becomes very noisy and, and clutters up the whole space uh, of your source code. So I found that kind of like, wow, new is optional. That's kind of cool. So this, I could change to say new, and it would do the same thing. So that was kind of like plus point number one for choosing Dart. And then as I read through the documentation, I realized that uh, it appears that the Dart team is working very closely with the Flutter team. And they're basically saying, we're after solving the following problems in graphics programming, uh, which is there's always a widget tree in every programming language. Who's, who programs on the web and knows what the DOM is? Everybody, even if you don't, you probably know what the DOM is. That is a tree. Okay? How do you form and create the DOM tree in web programming? You write HTML, right? If you programmed in other desktop, like when I used to program, and I'm dating myself, MFC, C++, Windows 90, uh, <laughs> NT 4.0, right? <laughs> uh, way back in the day, or Visual Basic, so if you had these drag and drop utilities where you could actually draw out your screen, and what they would do is they would sp spit out a config file that says, put a button here, put a, uh, put a slider over there, and on and on and on. And then something would read this config file and turn it into widgets. So the first kind of major decision that the designers of Flutter made was that there should not be a separate programming language or a format for describing what the widget tree looks like. Your widget tree will be described directly in code. Okay, So in the world of web programming, it's a little bit silly because you have to use three languages to make stuff happen. You have to use HTML to specify what your widget tree looks like. You have to use CSS to style the widget tree. And you have to use JavaScript to dynamically manipulate the widget tree. And then, of course, none of these are great. So nobody writes real HTML. They write some sort of templating language around it. And then nobody writes real CSS. They use some sort of CSS post processor. And nobody writes JavaScript. They use like TypeScript or some other thing, which is why I hated completely any kind of idea of doing GUI programming. It's like that is an exercise in eating glass. Like, kudos to anybody who does it. It's not for me, because I, I just it's too crazy. Uh, and so like this idea of I can use a real statically typed programming language that's been optimized to make the code concise that allows me to build up what my widget tree looks like, OK, I can live with that. I may want to give a talk about that so I can force myself to learn it. Okay. <laughs> So, so that's kind of the first thing that's nice about it. The second thing that, that I liked about it is, let's see if we can do this demo here. So we're going to go here. It has this rather fascinating feature called Hot Reload. Oh, come on. OK, apparently my computer, come on, mouse clicks, please. Move. OK, there we go. So it says Hello World here. So what I'd like to do is change it to Hello Toronto. And when I save it, oh, it actually hot reloaded on this one. Come on, come on. Hot reload. Oh. Press. I think I'm running two simulators. It doesn't like that, so come on. OK, demo fail. Uh, oh, oh, 
a second. Come on. Okay. Maybe it doesn't. Oh, hard, hard reload. Hard restart. Okay, you shouldn't have to press it. I've actually seen this. You you edit the code and it actually shows up on the simulator, but yeah, okay, there we go. Here's Hello Toronto. Let's try it again, but this time with Hello Toronto 2. Save. Come on, do it, do it, do it. I, oh. Okay, now, now you So I did an update today. That's what, that's what I get for doing the update today. Okay. Yeah. There was a, like I, I, it said you should update. I'm like, sure. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if it's because you're running double emulators there. Maybe yeah. it's Yeah, I'm going to let this do it. If you run it with one, it's fine. It does the hard Okay, so, so what are we going to do that? Let's do that. Let's run it with one. So what we're going to do now is go to our second one here and do the hot reload. If that doesn't work, we're going to stop this. Let's. I think the two just kind of made it not happy. So let's just do one, okay? And show you guys what what, what that looks like. Because, oh come on. Oh, I have. Oh, it wants to go to my actual iPhone. Hold on. I'll unplug my actual iPhone. You know what? It may. It may. Have. I I am I am on my way with beer. All right. All right. Oh, hello world, Toronto too. All right. Let's try. Three, <laughs> save. Come on, come on, come on. Let's see it. Oh man. Okay, guys. I'm sorry. I it was working in all the times I've tried it in the past. Um, sorry. Well, no. I'm pressing the same one down here. This one here. No, I was on the correct one. Oh, okay. This was the XR one. You got two main darts down there, though. That's, that is correct, because... No, I quit the Android emulator, guys. It's gone. It's a bug. That's what I get. Yeah, it normally works. It's brilliant. It's, uh, it was the thing when I shot... The, so y the idea is you can change this, the code that you're writing, and it goes and it changes, it updates without having to restart the app. It does have two options. One is uh, the, to actually restart the app uh, and one to actually reload it. But you know what? Maybe the iPhone simulator is bad. So let's try it one more time. Just close down the main dart down there, yeah. No, I, I you, No, yeah, if you close that, you will, when you run it, you will know which one will run for like main dart dart. Oh, it actually, I quit the, that's right, I quit the emulator, but the process was running and was disconnected. Thank you. Terminate, okay. All right, let's try it now, all right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's right. You, you got one. So, all right. No, no, why is there two? I didn't. It's not. Nothing is running right now, according to this button here. Oh my goodness! I actually cl did. I click it twice. <laughs> no, no, that's that's gone. I think that's just the history of what was there before. Okay, let's try one more time. Hello, Toronto Three. All right, let's see. Can we actually get it to say? Something other than Hello Toronto 3, yes. <laughs> Save it. Initializing hot reload, it could work. <laughs> oh. Da, da, da. Oh. 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 No. no. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Four times, right? Performing hot reload. Like, what is it performing hot reload to? Did it action? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is terrible. This is annoying. Come on. You gotta do it. You gotta do it. OK. 
Okay, this is just. You know what? I. I No, but it's, it's just does it. I've tried it before a million times with this. All right, let's try it. Like, wh why do you think that that's happening? What do you think I should change? Well, you're just not running it. I would say shut down the emulator yeah, as well. Yeah, let me do that too. Uh, it doesn't pass the entire app. It, pass, it, pass, it passes it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's basically what I want to be ex getting to explaining. Yeah. Um, so open. Hot patching, yeah. All right. Well, I can try a different. Uh, div maybe I try a different device. Let's try a Pixel. <laughs> yeah, it's been getting that too, and I've been submitting the same stack trace to Google for a few days, but they haven't fixed it. So. All right. We're going to stop this and power off. I am really going to try all the steps I can think of. <laughs> power it back on. All right. Final attempt. At this so final attempt. Okay, have I clicked it? Does it look good to you guys in the audience? All right, let's do it. Punch it. Let's see what happens. So anyway, what I like about it is apparently I seem to be able to not know anything about mobile programming, and I can like at least get Hello World working reasonably okay. And now it says Hello Toronto 4, and you can do Hello Toronto 5. Okay, I'm not saying anything. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's probably not going to work. <laughs> Isn't that the process of jinxing it? Yeah, well, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is it right? <laughs> it's I think it'll work if we change the whole Toronto 4. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's. Um, sorry, guys. It's. Uh, Oh, okay, just have to use your imagination. <laughs> Why it's not working, I don't know. Maybe there's a. I mean, it looks like it's still working. It's just not done yet. Yeah, it wasn't that slow when I played. I've always played with the. Yeah, it should be like. Okay. Do we want to try? Demo gods. Sorry, guys. All right. Okay. Let me let me let me switch. I'm gonna try. Really, I promise. This is the last time. <laughs> <laughs> this is really annoying me. Uh, uh, I don't like Visual Studio Code. I, I can't drive it very well, so no, no, not yet. Might have to go back to that. This is the fun thing about the Toronto Java User Group. It is my favorite meetup because it's just a fun crowd. And we always have fun. Doesn't matter what happens. All right. So, uh, final attempt. The really, truly final attempt. I'm going to drink more beer in case it helps. Right. Toronto 5. OK. Toronto 6. Save the file. It's like it's like it's completely disconnected from the simulator. Damn, darn. Like I don't know if any of the other demos will work, but I guess I just have to keep restarting things. Yeah. No, I, I would it. <laughs> yeah, let's try. No, we can try without that. Okay, final, final, final try. Yeah. And I was really surprised because it would happen like this it only happened last week. Right. But, like, yeah, there are three processes that I know, it was showing three, that's right. Yeah. Okay. More than it used to work, like once you save it was like automatically load. So I think it's a bug it's, a it's, it's gotta be.
All right, guys. I'm sorry, I can't demonstrate this, but I, I, I give up. I give up on demonstrating it. I truly now give up. All right, moving on. So hot reload was going to be this thing that was going to be the wow moment, right? And watch the videos from the professionals from Google, and it doesn't fail them. Uh, that's scared of them. Yeah, it's pre-recorded. All right, so. Um, so, so that's that. So now that you kind of got the idea that you can work with either one, how does this thing actually work? Let's talk a little bit about the architecture of this thing. Um, so what happens with it is that everything is a widget, right? So you start out, there's two types of widgets. They have stateless and stateful. I don't want to talk about the difference between them right now. So let's talk about stateless because it's easier. Oh, I've lost my Zoom, right? Hold on. I will, I will share my screen again. All right, all right. So, um, so one of the things about the widget tree that gets created is very, very interestingly, it is immutable. You cannot change it ever. Every time you change something about it, it rebuilds the whole entire tree and rebuilds everything based on the tree. So this is the high-level architecture of how this thing works. So at the bottom of it, there is the Dart virtual machine and like the Dart runtime and all of that. That's all written in, I guess, C and C++. Uh, um, sorry, that's the platform-specific stuff. Like it calls iOS to do things. Then there's the C and C++ engine that's part of it. And then on top of that, there's all the code that's written in Dart. And that consists of basically a whole bunch of very low-level graphics things, like draw a pixel at this point and you know, uh, do various things. It uses a, a, an open source library that's like a 2D graphics library. Uh, I forgot what it's called now in C++. Huh? Skia. Skia, yeah, that's what it's called. And then on top of that, in Dart, it builds like rendering and then widgets. And then at the top of the widgets, you'll notice two. One is Material and one is Cupertino. So when you ask it to create a button, it doesn't call iOS and say, hey, create a button. It actually draws pixel by pixel something that is pixel perfect, identical to an iOS button. When you ask it to create a button on an Android, it doesn't call Android and say, hey, please draw a button for me. Actually, pixel by pixel draws out a particular uh, button. So this allows you to have the same code base work in two different platforms. And things look the same. Does that make sense to folks? And so all of the widgets that you would expect to be there are there um, uh, for that. So let's now that we got a little bit of this, let's actually um, create a new hello world and destroy this doomed hello world that we have here. So I'm going to quit the simulator just in case it helps. Not expecting to. Uh, start a new Android project. Uh, no, not an Android project. Uh, cancel. Start a new Flutter project. Next, uh, Flutter app 3. I think it objected to the name tjug in the, there's some code that says if you have the word jug in it, it doesn't work. <laughs> so. Um, what we want to look at now is something that actually does something. <laughs> so is this, this helps more explain uh, a little bit about the, the widgets and all of that. So I will uh, start my iOS simulator. And I will also launch the application. All right. So this is kind of the, the hello world app that you get out of Flutter. So this time, I have a, my main method. It just calls run and goes to my app, which is a, a, a Dart class, which is extending from stateless widgets. So the whole entire app is considered a widget. Uh, I can hit this plus button down here, and you can see it remembers where it's at. And uh, OK, what is this thing? It's extending from a stateless widget. So what makes something a widget is that you have a build method. In the build method, you return a widget. And you're supposed to say, my widget has the following children inside of it. 
So the first widget that I'm asking it to create is a material app widget, which is who's heard of material design, Google's like, you know, UI look and feel and all of that. And so they have an implementation of material design for, for Flutter. And then you can pass it a bunch of parameters. So I'm calling the constructor for material app, and it very beautifully looks a lot like a JSON object, doesn't it? So this is one of the nice things about uh, calling down to functions and methods in Dart is you can pass parameters as named uh, value pairs. Uh, and so I say the title is Flutter Demo, and then I give it a theme, uh, which is the, the blue theme. And then I say, OK, um, because this is a material app, it has to have a title. It's also like, hey, where's your home screen? And my home, my home page is a another object that I'm creating, which is now this time a stateful widget because it has data in it, the, the number eight, how many times you've actually clicked on it. Okay, um, And so this particular widget, um, because it's extending from stateful, uh, it, it, you don't store state in widgets. Widgets are just the current configuration of the render of the widget hierarchy. And I'll explain to you later how it turns that into two other trees in order to render stuff. So it works a lot like a compiler to a certain extent. Uh, so you have the my home page extends this thing. Then you have the actual state object. So now you're saying this my home page state object is storing the state for the widget called my home page. And there it is, a private variable that is the state that you want to keep. Uh, and you know a method called increment counter. Now in the in the increment counter here, I call set state, which and inside of it I'm passing a lambda. So you got like that's how you do lambdas in Java, uh, you, except you don't need like an arrow syntax or anything. Um, and then I modify the value of this object by putting it inside a set state. I'm letting Flutter know that the state, the data that is tied to my widget has changed. So can you please rebuild the affected part of the widget tree? So that will, when I call set state, will cause it to call the build method. And here is where I actually say, in my screen, I have a scaffold. The scaffold has an app bar. This particular app bar is going to correspond to this app bar over here. And I'm setting inside of it a text object. And then in the body, I'm creating another widget, the center widget, to center stuff. And then it has a child, which is a column widget. And in that column widget, I'm saying I want things to be aligned in the center. That has a bunch of child widgets. The first one has static text that says, you've pushed the button this many times. The second one is, second favorite feature of Flutter, string of Dart, string interpolation. So I'm able to do string interpolation on dollar underscore counter, which is all the way up here, because this does like lexical scoping just like JavaScript. Okay? Um, and then I'm saying what my style is that I'd like for it. And then at the bottom, then the other child is I have a floating action bar, which has a, uh, the little plus button here uh, with the increment counter. And now, what is underscore increment counter? It is this method over here. You're like, why do things have underscore in them? That's because there are no private, public, protected keywords in Dart. Uh, if you want something to be private, just put underscore in front of it. Again, they're trying to make the language terse for when you're writing these really deep object hierarchies that you're creating because you're describing a widget tree with a programming language. Is it, Question? Sorry, is it uh, the underscore, is it just a convention like Python, or does it mean anything? Like actually a private? Yeah. Sorry? It is, is it just like a convention, or does no. it actually make things no. private? It makes things private. No. It does make things private. So interestingly, I couldn't find in like a Dart compiler, there's a Dart analyzer, which will tell you where all your problems are in the code. Uh, but this thing, so the, part of the reason why they're picking Dart is, A, they control the runtime. So the actual Dart VM has a couple of interesting things. Uh, uh, if you're a garbage collector geek like I am, it actually has a generational garbage collector. And it works exactly like the Java. Uh, so for the young generation, they have a copy collector. 
Okay, you know who knows what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. So that basically means here's the problem. Let's say like this was pretty simple, and if you all right, step back. So we had this thing. What does the actual widget tree look like? This is what the widget tree looks like currently because there is a thing called the widget inspector or the Flutter inspector here, which is kind of like the inspector you find in Chrome when you're building a web app. You can go here, and I should be able to, again, demo failing all the time. We'll see if this works. Um, oh, look. I clicked there, and it highlighted that part of the widget tree. And it tells me where what this corresponds to in here. So you can see it's a column widget with a text child and another text child. You guys with me so far on this? So when you start playing around and modifying the widget tree, you are potentially going to create thousands of objects. If you're creating a lot of objects in a garbage collected language, you dread the garbage collector pause. How do you avoid the garbage collector pause? Well, it turns out that a lot of objects die young. This is what in garbage collection uh, geekdom is the weak, uh, the, the, that your objects die young. So with a copy collector, what happens is that uh, it's just a pointer bump in order to create a new object. So you have a, uh, a space here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some diagrams on this by going to the Dart uh, Lang website. And to do to do to do to do. Um, hold on. Uh, Dart. Yeah, these are my diagrams. OK, so that's kind of how it works. So whenever you create an object, it goes into the active space. And in a copy collector, half of your memory is never used. So as you create objects, when this thing gets full, it says, great, um, time to, so OK, let's walk through them. Step one, they're both empty. You create a bunch of objects. Step three, it fills out. Step four, it says, I need to run a garbage collection cycle. So it figures out which are the dead objects, which are the live one. It'll copy all the live ones into the, uh, the other space, and it also compresses them. Because the memory is all aligned, when you create a brand new object, it just bumps up a pointer. So anybody in Java land that's ever done object pooling to help the garbage collector grow up, don't try that. It's <laughs> terrible. I once had a banker argue with me over the need for object pooling in 2017. It's like didn't know how to, t I bit my tongue quite a few times and started bleeding. OK. Uh, so, uh, the, so what happens afterwards is that it will do a swap. So what that means is that the old thing where you were allocating objects now becomes the free one where you, the, the one that's no longer used. And the new one has some extra space that gets used up. So this means that your memory allocations are incredibly fast. Your deallocations are also very fast. But not everything runs right away. So there is a parallel mark and sweep collector, which basically is not explained here. All you need to know is it's pretty fast. There's an old generation where if you survive, if as an object you bounce around between those two semi-spaces, I don't know, five, six, seven times, you'll get promoted out of the young generation into the old generation. And when that happens, you will not die until there is a mark and sweep collection. Very interestingly, unlike Java, the actual Flutter GUI runtime has hooks into the garbage collector to tell it when it is safe to run, so it doesn't end up running while you're updating the GUI or doing something, which would cause your application to pause. These are the kinds of things that you would need to add to a virtual machine to make that virtual machine suitable for GUI programming which is, I think, another reason why they ended up using um, Dart as opposed to Java or uh, on the JVM. Okay. Uh, so that covers that. Um, where am I now? OK. So uh, going back to the code, let's see if I got all of the things. So you can see here that's the case. OK, good. That works. Um, let's minimize that. 
So now that you, you kind of got the idea, you're going to build up this, this object hierarchy, what, how, does, how does layout work? So let's present here. OK, so this is uh, taken directly out of the, the, the Flutter docs. So let's say you, this is what you want to do. You want to render a bar that has a, uh, a call, route, and share. So what will happen is the outside, that would be a container uh, uh, widget which will have inside of it a row widget. And the row widgets will lay things out horizontally. That row widget will have three column widgets, the one for this, the one for this one, and the one for that one. The, this particular one will then have an icon object, which is uh, the first item in the column, the top of the column. And then it will have a container. And then it will have a text object that says call. Okay. Similarly, the middle one will say, I've got a column. Uh, contain a, a column widget, which has an icon and underneath a container and text. Same thing on the right-hand side, column, icon, container. You're like, OK, who's getting it? Hey, you see that thing at the top. OK, that's the, the object hierarchy you need to create. So let's the talk of, sorry? Those containers at the bottom are redundant. No, they're not. Well, are they now? Like, OK, tell me about it. But that's how you specify padding and stuff like that. You can just wrap it in padding. OK, I'm not, uh, OK. Don't ask me too many hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is conceptually how you want to think about it, is the, the, the different uh, widgets do different types of things for you, right? So um, uh, next point is that. Uh, um, Right. Okay. So that's basically what it is. Same thing. If you want to do another kind of uh, layout, you look at it. You're like, okay, how do I break this up into rows and columns? So the model with the rows and columns is based off of the CSS flex box model. So if you know that, you'll get an idea of how it works. So what I figured out is if I want to write a layout in Flutter, first I have to draw it out on a piece of paper to see what I want. Then I have to translate it mentally into what would the Java ob uh, the Dart widgets look like, and then you type it, and you keep playing with it until it works. But I also found that there's this handy thing called the Flutter Studio. Uh, let me just find it here, Flutter Studio. Some really nice, smart person who I don't know made this thing where you can kind of like go here and drag and drop a bunch of things. Um, so I could say, like, you can see, like, I'm building up the, OK, I want this. Maybe I want some text down here. And as you do it, eventually, you can go and you can click on, all right, I move this out of the way, uh, source code. And it generates the Flutter code that will go with that layout. So you can kind of do a little bit of drag and drop and, you know, take it, copy and paste it over. The expectation is, as a developer, eventually you know mentally like what all the parameters are that you would pass and how you, you know which widgets go where and how they interact with each other so once you learn those patterns i presume you would be able to close your eyes imagine what it looks like with your eyes closed type the code and it will work and that's what more experienced professional flutter developers tell me happens is that true or for the professionals in the room okay cool so so that covers that um, so there's a little handy feature where uh, Flutter will actually, if you start doing things that fall off the screen, it's going to start rendering these things that tells you this thing will not fit on the screen anymore. Because like, the model is that whatever is being rendered has a set of constraints that it needs to live within. And it, is, it decides how to lay itself out within that constraint. So in that respect, it's a kind of a classic game rendering engine type architecture. OK, so let's talk now about the final topic. Yeah. Question, question, yeah. Question. yeah. How does it handle something like, uh, I don't know, uh, Android Pixel and uh, iPhone 8? Ah, great question. How does it handle iPhone Pixel and Android 8 and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so it has the concept of uh, the device independent pixels. So when you're, when you're specifying the size of things, you don't specify those 
an actual real device pixels, you always specify them in terms of device independent pixels. What the heck are device independent pixels? So device independent pixels are a, um, yeah, dips. So if you know what those are, you know, it's, it's, that's basically how it does it. And that works. It knows how to normalize it for the iPhone, for the Android, for all the, for all the different devices. So if you, if you don't know what that is, it's very fascinating. Uh, device independent pixels, you can Google it. There's some really wonderful uh, videos online that totally, very clearly explain the history of this whole thing. So but it, yeah, it's the same thing. It's device independent pixels for everything. Professional Flutter developers, did I get it? Is there more to add? But what I would add is for devices like the iPhone and stuff, it's a widget. It's a widget. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a lot of components in Flutter. Yeah. Widget. Widget. All right. So, so here's here's kind of like, uh, like again in the in the in the interest of explaining like the architecture of this thing and how how it works, we have. Let's imagine you have this simple app, uh, extending stateless widget. When you build it, you create a container, and that has a text object in it. So what this ends up looking like is this. You have a widget tree which says, I have a simple app. I have a simple container, which is the color white. And then that has a simple text. And that has two attributes, the color blue and the text. So the widget tree is specifying the configuration of the widgets. That widget tree then is used to create what's called an element tree. The element tree is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And then that element tree is then used to create another tree called the render tree. The render tree is the really expensive objects where it's keeping track of this is what's on the screen. Here's, it's computed all of the mathematics. And so as you make modifications to the widget tree, it's just like React and, and the, you know, the React framework. It does a diff between the old tree, the new tree, and figures out the minimum number of moves it needs to make the, the, to, to modify the element and render trees to make them reflect the new configuration in the widget tree. Does that make sense to people? It's a really interesting model. The fact they can, they can do this at like 60 frames per second plus speaks to, when I said earlier, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. You're going to reproduce pixel for pixel all of Android and all of, uh, and all of uh, uh, iPhone and you're going to do it from the ground up, and you're going to do a different programming language with a VM that's like got really decent garbage collection and a decent programming language that's optimized for um, writing like GUI code. Hmm, interesting. I think that's something I want to learn. And that's how I found myself in front of you tonight. <laughs> so um, was there other things I wanted to share with you about it? I think I've had enough demo fails for one day. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so again, if anybody would like to become the organizer of the Flutter meetup, uh, please uh, speak to me. I'll transfer ownership to you. Otherwise, I will delete the meetup. Because <laughs> I, I don't intend to have any more. Uh, any more. I, I'm not going to be organizing sessions. I am an amateur in the world of uh, mobile. I'm just excited about this. It's got to be all really excited about graphics programming again. So thanks for being here. Any questions that I may know the answer to, you can ask me now. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, Bi-directional text? Oh, can you, can you generate, oh, can you convert Xcode to Flutter? No, but there's a way to embed Flutter inside of an existing app. So you, you can embed the Flutter code inside of an uh, iOS, Android, or an Android app. So you can say, I'm building a new feature in Flutter, and then include it as like a library in your Xcode application.
project, you can see that there's actual Android and iOS code that you can write. And so you can write the whole plugin if you're using yeah. the native code. So you can do bidirectional in that way and in, in, the, in that way. So you can do both. Yeah, cool. You're using a fixed size emulator. I'm wondering, in previous experience uh, working with constraint based layout, what I would do is basically just open it up on a on the canvas and basically just resize the canvas quickly just to make sure that I can test for all the different sizes and, and cons the beauty of constraint-based layout, you could see exactly how it's constraining. Yeah, so I, I so, so in, in, in my case, so I, I, I can't do anything like beyond writing my name that looks pretty. <laughs> so I assume that whoever is designing the widget toolkit, and that was the other attractiveness of it. Yeah. Something like the material widget toolkit is fairly extensive, designed by professionals, I'm like, I'm happy with the default theme. It's 100 times better than anything I can do. They've tested all that stuff as far as I'm concerned. Right, but when you have widgets, you're putting, you might be putting like dozens, of, um, if not hundreds of widgets on the page. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's okay. of uh, resizing. Yeah. Um, and it's the only difference for resizing. It's just you can go away from a phone to a computer screw. Right, but if you have a, like a live canvas as opposed to email, you know, it's okay. Yeah. You can have yeah. desktop. What's it look like to like handle an event where you want to change the widget tree? Well, it looks just like it does over here, right? Oh, you would just like delete and, and remove stuff from the widget tree. Like you, you would have like a stateful widget. Like they have things like a list view, and now that's going to feed off of a real list, and you just remove items from the list, and it does the right thing. Like the Let's say I want to like, I have two pages, and I want to go from one page oh, to Oh, they have like a, it's like a router, like, yeah. Okay. Like it's a stack, and you, you push stuff, yeah. the screen off, and you push a different one on, and all that. Okay. That's, yeah. Last time I checked, um, there was like a little bit, the video support wasn't like so complete, and it didn't have like a web view. Uh, does it have a web view now? Yes. It does. <laughs> <laughs> So I just expect the, I'm just expecting Google to keep investing in it and making it better. Like, I'm somewhat, like when, you know, like, you know when you had Gwit in Java? Gwit was one of those that I never touched. Spent a lot of time looking at it because I was pretty sure the people that built Gwit were gonna get bored and move on and do other stuff, which is exactly what happened, unfortunately. Because I'm like, man, you need to have a PhD in CS to, to build a compiler from Java to JavaScript. Uh, so I never use that, but this one feels different. I generally don't trust Google when it comes to open source at all, because they do have a habit of abandoning all like open source projects like Gwit and other stuff. This one feels like maybe they won't. So they, they're really pushing it because the way I discovered about it was through their Google I/O conversation right. that they're having. So right now they're having it where you can submit your app before April the fifth, and they want people to actually contribute, build, learn. Oh. Oh, wow. So they're actually pushing people to, this is how I was like, oh, yeah. okay, this is good, <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm, I'm right, your computer, but yeah. I mean, I don't know that I say that, um, uh, all the ad words you see in Gmail are written yeah. in Dart. I personally believe that Flutter was created to keep Dart alive. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think Dart, uh, Flutter's going to go into Yeah, they, they have so um, many competing things. Like, yeah. They just rewrote their Java to JavaScript compiler. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go in further than that. Um, the uh, communication that Google has with the press for Flutter go beyond what we see from almost any other platform that they're pushing. Yeah. It's, it's really something that they're doing right now with all their communication that they're out there. Yeah, question? Sorry, go ahead. Does this say, when you guys said you can uh, do desktop apps with this as well, can you cross compile this JavaScript to make a web app? Yeah, so what it does is when yeah. Flutter actually compiles, it, comes out, it, it, it compiles down to binary code. So it actually compiles onto the native code. So it'll be like compile down to iOS, compile down to Android, compile down to JavaScript, depending on the platform you're yeah, using. Okay, well, Hummingbird needs to be mentioned here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hummingbird. Hummingbird is a framework of turning existing Flutter apps into web apps. With yeah, yeah, that's, that's what you use it for. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a very promising technology. Like, as a very now somewhat old developer, I guess, I. I, I've seen enough technologies come and go 
this one feels like it has the right characteristics to survive for the long run, partly because there are so many pieces where, like, I watched the videos that got me excited, like the, like the, the actual developers of it, I don't know, I found these like internal meetings at Google that they somehow published online on YouTube. And they were all like ex people that worked on, on uh, um, like uh, Silverlight and uh, Macromedia Flash. And like these are people that have been around the block a few times with this type of stuff. So this is probably their third or fourth system. So they're kind of probably going to get it right this time. So <laughs> And the fact that it had tooling and hot reload, really. Hot reload got me. I think Show us how it works. Actually, it might work with this thing. Yeah. <laughs> I know, this one Just probably will work, yeah. Yeah, because you have text in that app, which is a stateless widget. So, yes. And hot reload preserves state, so there was no state to preserve. OK, let's try that. Let's try that. <laughs> Let us actually. Yeah, I know. That's uh, remove the floating button button. Okay, should I change this here? <gasps> it works. <laughs> okay, that's what's supposed to happen. Yes, that's it. So yours was state full. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So for all the people that came for the Flutter meetup, welcome to the Java user group. <laughs> and now you know that. The Java user group likes to have meetings about non-Java related topics that are of interest to developers. So uh, you're all welcome to speak here, talk to talk to me, Jonathan, and and, uh, and Dan. And if you'd like to speak, you can get a uh, a code uh, for IntelliJ. And if you'd like to take over the Flutter meetup, you can get a code for IntelliJ. <laughs> well, in fact, what now with our <laughs> Uh, one of the things is uh, JetBrains is really cool. They actually have a program for meetups. So you just go, you say, here's my meetup, and they start sending you two codes every two months. And they'll give you, and they'll like, give it to your meetup to the people that show up and raffle it and all that type of stuff. So they're very nice people. Oh, awesome. Any other questions? Last year it was like, I think it was a six week uh, workshop, and uh, yeah, and it culminated in like Android TO, the, the Toronto Android Conference. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in Flutter, I'd definitely look into that because last year was really fun and everybody kind of made apps and showed each other our apps and everything. Yeah, and by the way, if. <laughs> so, by the way, if you're a meetup, like the Java group, we always meet here. I work for Pivotal, we have a great event space. Should you need an event space, let me know. We have fit about 120 people there. Yep. Yeah, Question? Your main oh, right. I forgot to talk about that. Yes. <laughs> For the Java developers. Yes, yes. Thank you. That's a great question. So there is in Dart a file called pubspec in YAML. I don't know. I mean, like, Maven at least is in XML. YAML is like. <laughs> I have a saying, because I spend a lot of time, I do a lot of backend stuff, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes. My favorite thing now, someday, your kids will inherit the YAML that you wrote. <laughs> Enjoy it. So there is a YAML file. You can specify your dependencies. There is something called uh, Dart uh, Pub, which is oh, not Dart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is like the 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 Maven uh, the Maven of uh, uh, of this thing. Okay, there's a video player. Uh, it's a little bit better than Maven because when you click here, there is a README file that shows up and gives you examples. I mean, I wish Maven had this. Uh, there is a change log. There's some examples, I guess, how to install it, and uh, history of versions. I mean, this is great. Uh, I like it. So that's why I'm like I'm excited about Dart. I'm, which one? Where, where? Oh, 100%. Oh. Great. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right, so we're going to continue on, on the other side. Um, 
We typically stay here till they kick us out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, drinking on the other side when they shut down the place. Oh.